you so much, all of you, for coming today. And it's a real pleasure to be here amongst literally all friends. And, and it's particularly chilling to see people I haven't seen in years. And everybody has made the effort to you know, come down from various places just to join in, in this lecture and this travel story. And maybe talking about travel is uh, a good idea because it gets people to think about destinations where they might want to go. So um, it's a slightly unusual lecture to prepare because actually scientists meet the interested public. And that's not so much the problem. The main problem with this lecture is that they also have to appeal to the other scientists in the audience. And it's really the kind of bridging all of these gaps uh, that you know, is the challenge with this lecture. And I was fretting about it because there are many stories to tell. And the end, I just decided I tell you some of my travels and I weave in some of the exciting things that happened in science on the way. And I've decided to make it, make it quite personal because people who want to come to the real science lectures, they've probably been to most of the conferences that I go to as well. So just to set a bit of a scene, because there are people in this audience who don't even speak English, like my mother, and I really appreciate Danke, dass Sie gekommen bist. And, uh, for, and there are people in the audience who've never heard of T-cells. And it's got nothing to do with the cup of tea that you've just had. Just for the young crowd over there, it's got nothing to do with T-Mobile. It has everything to do with this, where a cell, which is this yellow thing here, named T-cell, because it comes from the thymus, meets another cell, which is a macrophage, and you'll hear lots more about it. I also talk a lot about facts, and Jim always thinks I'm talking about fax machines, but actually I'm not. It's fluorescent activated cell sorting, and it's a way to identify the profile of cells, what they look like, the kind of the, the clothes that they wear, and the jobs that they do. So you'll hear a bit about that. But first of all, in order to take you with me, I do have to give you a quick crash course in immunology, and I hope nobody gets in a mad panic about it. Because all I want to tell you, really, is that there are some key players that have been influential on my scientific developments, and they're very influential for all the survival of uh, all of us, in fact. And here's a, a very nice picture of uh, some bacteria in chains here that uh, in, are getting engulfed by this great big gray-looking cell, which is a macrophage, which is then associated with a T cell. And to put this in a cartoon way, the antigen, which is the bacteria, get eaten up by the macrophages, and then some of their bits and pieces, primarily their proteins, get exposed to their surface, and then these uh, surface-expressed uh, uh, products activate some of the T cells that are hanging around. So these guys then start having a dialogue, and this T cell that was lying there dormantly, quite naively hanging around, all of, all of a sudden becomes activated and is turning into a helper cell. The other two bits of the jigsaw you need to know is that they're B cells and T cells. B cells are all called B cells because they come from the bone marrow. So next time you have a nice soup, think about it. They um, uh, come from the bone marrow and they are produced in, they hang out in lymphoid organs. And it's not quite as simple because from the bone marrow they migrate out into the periphery, into lymphoid organs, and they differentiate into all sorts of shapes and forms that have a variety of names which matter to some of us and to some of us not. With the T cells, they come as T as thymus, they uh, get produced in the thymus, and then again, they go on to a migratory journey where they acquire, in a sense, they have no clothes, and then they acquire various bits of clothing on their way, and they differentiate into what the nomenclature calls CD4 and CD8 T cells, and CD stands for cluster of differentiation. Again, it's just a nomenclature. Once they're in the periphery, they actually then group into more and more subgroups. So it's almost like you've got the naive pupils here who all haven't quite decided their career path yet. And then through various influences on their path, they get primed in a certain way. So they then uh, go to differentiate into their various functions. And because of the immune system having the ability to generate immunological memory, we have also learned a great deal of how out of these cells some memory cells develop. Because if you think about it, we get exposed to so many organisms all over our lives that there must be a way that our body defends itself against getting ill again with the same germ, and that's called immunological memory. And then, what is also very important 
for all of what we do, communication matters. And communication between the B and T cells has been a subject of some of our research. It's not just communication, but also age matters. And when you look at this picture here, you see generation of four generations of members of my family from me being about four, my sister being a baby, to my great-granddad, who was in his 80s at this point. And obviously, the immune responses in all of us are going to be very different. And when you look at this guy with his newborn baby, which happened to be Jim and Sebastian, their differences will also be quite uh, obvious, because this baby would have been born with a very immature immune system, and this man would have acquired some protection, although I have to say he fell ill a lot in the first two years of having a new child. <laughs> so not just the age matters for the immune system, but to just give you an idea how age matters for survival of children. Some of you might know that there is under the age of five, children are particularly vulnerable to succumb to infections. And here's a pie chart that shows out of the 7.6 million children under the age of five that die every year in the world, a great number of them die of infections, pneumonia, diarrhea, and there are many people in this room who've spent almost all of their life looking after children with infections in various uh, um, manifestations. And a lot of them die as babies, so it's obviously a very vulnerable period. Not just your age, but also where you live matters, because if you live in very resource-poor settings, the majority of those deaths will occur in sub-Saharan Africa, about 4.36 million of these deaths, compared to Europe, where the infant and childhood mortality is much less. So um, what determines whether we're well or we're not well actually already starts in utero. And uh, here this cartoon summarizes the magnitude of differences between the sterile environment in the fetal environment where the baby is literally engulfed, uh, surrounded by this, this sack of amniotic fluid and really not much infectious agents get through there. And as a consequence also to tolerate the pregnancy, the uh, immune system is somewhat downregulated and it's pitched towards a state of tolerance rather than a, a, a stage of defense because when you're in utero, actually you need to be tolerant of your mother and your mother needs to be tolerant of you rather than you having to fight bacterial infections. However, once you come out, and you grow up, you can be quite a fragile, small individual who then has to um, fight off various pathogens, be it viruses or bacteria. And um, in order to help, we give vaccines because the vaccines educate the immune system to respond to recurring infections uh, in a timely fashion. Or in some children, it's just mud, really. <laughs> when you're about five, your immune system is just about at its peak, and you can see here, it's definitely coming forward fighting. Because this child happened to be Sebastian, and I have cleared all of these pictures with my son, don't worry. Um, <laughs> uh, having given the vaccine, having seen an infection, this process has initiated the crosstalk between the T cells <coughs> and the B cells, the T cells producing the lovely helper cells and memory, and inspiring the B cells to then produce the antibodies, which will help this young person to fight off infection. And we're probably the healthiest we ever will be between five and 12 in our lives. And once puberty hits, it's all downhill from there. So what can we do about this? And how can we come up with maneuvers that actually somewhat influence the fragility of these very early times in childhood? And it's, um, you know, when I started off, I, caught, I thought we could just improve the world and if everybody was a bit better off, maybe that would, that would help infectious diseases. But obviously, the grand proposal for that didn't go very well. So I decided maybe I needed to be a bit more focused. And the areas in which I focused uh, are highlighted here. So you could go about it by understanding the bacteria. And there are people in this audience who can do that much better than me. There's Douglas Young here, there's uh, Brian Spratt. These people have fantastic knowledge about bacteria, so I felt they'd already taken that on, so maybe it wasn't the right niche. If you could understand the immune system, and I just see Paul Weiss up there who, you know, spends his daily life and trying to manipulate the immune system by giving people bone marrow transplants. And again, they were doing a great job there, so I wasn't going to become a basic immunologist like Charles Bangham. But because I trained as a clinician, I thought the place where I was best placed was actually at the interface between the pathogen and the immune system. And within this interface, I've developed a uh, particular interest in vaccination, 
uh, delivery of proven interventions and uh, potentially immunomodulation. So this all started off, just to remind you, I'm actually, I never set out to become a scientist. I set out to become a doctor. I didn't even set out to become a pediatrician. But uh, I grew up in this, in this place in Germany, um, which was quite a small place, and went to university in Cologne, and uh, ended up, as many medical students do, doing some sort of night services to uh, various departments to make a bit of cash for my travel on the side. But I, I fell straight into the height of the HIV epidemic that was going on in that area at the time, with a huge number of young people pretty much the same age as me, presenting to the HIV clinic uh, in Cologne with, you know, quite disfiguring uh, lesions which are consistent with Kaposi sarcoma. And this was clinically a very demanding time because we didn't have antiretroviral therapy. We had very few interventions apart from putting people on septrin. And it was scientifically exhilarating because it was really the beginning of trying to understand what the interactions between this immune system and the virus were. And it was psychologically quite tough because a lot of these people died. And obviously now, they wouldn't. And my doctoral thesis at the time was on um, the therapy of uh, Kaposi sarcoma with interferon uh, alpha, which I presented at the AIDS conference in, in 89 in Montreal, which was the first sort of huge meeting I went to, and obviously that left quite a, uh, an impression. And what was more important out of this thesis came sort of an affinity to CD4 T cells because the response to the therapy that we were giving these patients entirely depended on their baseline CD4 count in the absence of any other maneuvers that we could do to improve their immune system. I came to the UK in 1989 and I trained as a pediatrician eventually um, going to Great Ormond Street and in fact I had an interview at Great Ormond Street as a very, very junior person. I hadn't even done any pediatrics. And I had applied for a job which was between Brussels and Great Ormond Street, and that sounded great to me. And obviously they didn't give me the job because I didn't have any experience in pediatrics. But on the interview board was Mike Levine. And he said to me, why don't you go away and do a couple of years of decent pediatric training, and then you come back and look us up again. And I followed this advice ever since. So um, I then ended up at Great Ormond Street really in clinical training and I'm telling you this because it put me back in touch with the science that I had experienced in, during my, my doctoral thesis in Germany because all of a sudden we had children with Kaposi sarcoma and we had a little guy who was Novelli who's in the audience uh, and I managed for a very long time whose name was Mutu and he had this uh, not quite bad skin lesions but he had a lot of lesions in his lungs and he had ascites and he was really quite poorly. We had to kind of take fluid off his lungs on a twice weekly basis. But nevertheless, he had a fantastic sense of humor. And I remember the wardrobe when we walked in and he'd written this little poem which starts off with, my name is Mutu and I got a big belly. And Vasya, forgive me for telling the second half, which was, but not quite as big as Dr. Novelli. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, that kind of brought me back to a place where really academic medicine was being practiced in, in a fantastic way. And uh, I got to St. Mary's, which is where Mike had by then set up camp and uh, had offered me a registrar position and showing that I was a reasonable doctor. He obviously thought maybe I could be something in science as well. So um, he introduced me to this other fabulous man who was on the same corridor, Douglas Young. And in between them, they designed my PhD project on the back of a brown envelope, which basically said, take blood, add mycobacteria, and then tell us what protects against proliferation of mycobacterial disease. Except when it was written, it looked more like that, because Mike's handwriting is really terrible. And subsequently, and also you might notice that the envelope was not closed, there was no money in it. So uh, we had to write some grants and, and get the funding. And then, uh, you know, four years later, I had my PhD. By this point, I also had a small boy. And we were all having fun in Hyde Park being in Capes. I tell you what I did in this PhD, and it was um, uh, taking advantage of a construct that had already been uh, made in Douglas Young's lab, which was using reporter gene engineered mycobacteria with an insert of a luciferase gene, which could be used in order to, uh, to enumerate bacteria without having to grow them on colonies. 
um, because it takes three weeks otherwise for mycobacteria to grow, and if you have this sort of light-emitting construct, you can almost immediately see how many of them there are. And so, um, and I nicked this slide from Adrian, which he made a little while ago. So just to explain the principle to you, if you have a blood sample and you put in these bacteria, so if they're well, their light is on. If they're not well, their light is off. And they get well or less well by being exposed to the host cells. So if you put in the bacteria, you have at the baseline the same emission of light. You then let uh, the bacteria grow, and you will see that there is, depending on the host, and depending on that host immune system, there are more or less bacteria. And then you can calculate how many there were at the end compared to the beginning, and that's called a growth ratio. And in this person, you can see that growth ratio will be about two, and this person will be about four. So all of a sudden you have an instrument to measure what happens with uh, mycobacterial survival in a given sample. So we explored this model um, in some detail, and not only could we measure the survival of the mycobacteria, but could also take off other samples to measure cytokines, which are the messenger uh, substances that go around with cells, and we could uh, then analyze various differences between hosts. And here's a quick snapshot of, of uh, summary data, which uh, uh, sort of set us up to test this model in the field. So we showed that people who have uh, sensitization to mycobacteria being PPD tuberculin test positive as opposed to tuberculin test negative are better able to control the mycobacteria in this in vitro system. And this was down to their CD4 T cells. So I keep coming back to this uh, theme of CD4 T cells because if we took out their CD4 T cells, all of a sudden they were growing just as well as the ones who were tuberculin negative. So it showed that the presence of CD4 T cells was really instrumental for controlling the, uh, um, the multiplication of the mycobacteria. And if we did that with CD8 T cells, which is the other group, it didn't work quite so well. And this all coincided with the observation that in HIV-infected patients whose T cells are not working well or are depleted, growth of mycobacteria is actually um, expressed as susceptibility to tuberculosis. And there are many people out there who are dually infected with TB and HIV. And the reason why that happens is because their T cells don't work. And uh, if their T cells count is very, very low, as expressed here by this advanced state um, in the WHO classification, then the chances of them also having TB is very high. And if you have better CD4 counts, then it's not so bad. And if you put people on antiretroviral therapy, which takes away the damage to their immune system, then um, it is uh, uh, highly efficient. So this assay now needed to move out of the lab into the wider international arena. And I was fortunate to be awarded a Wellcome Trust uh, training fellowship which got me to spend uh, a year in, uh, at Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I think the, the main memories that my family will have from this is Sebastian will always think that's the only ever time we had a red pickup truck. And uh, obviously, you know, he had special helmets designed that were made for CD4 T cells. And he uh, retained a very, very fond affinity for the Cleveland Indians. We published a few papers by putting our assay side by side with assays that had been designed by collaborators in Cleveland and also in St. Louis uh, to see if our assay would perform in an equal or you know, a similar way. And uh, we managed to sort of attract quite a bit of international recognition for this assay because it's one of the few assays that is used to measure uh, survival of bacteria in this sort of cell-mediated setting. But really where I wanted to be was at the interface of the TB and HIV co-infection because I had a model that needed to be applied to the real life situation where people were, um, were duly infected and where we could study the intricate uh, components that would uh, say whether their TB infection was going to take hold or whether potentially we could protect them against uh, uh, tuberculosis with new vaccines. So I set out to Cape Town in South Africa uh, in uh, 19, no, 2001, and I did conduct work there for the following 10 days with uh, a great number of collaborators, and we kept on going back and I have these nice shots of me not growing very much, but my child growing quite a lot. Everyone who's been to Cape Town knows that it's really a beautiful place when you see it from the air, but people also know that it's a tough place on the ground where People live in quite deprived conditions, and uh, 
there is a great hospital of fantastic expertise which allowed me to conduct uh, laboratory work and I'm really pleased that the research nurse who joined me on this very first project is here tonight in Shumikazi. I'm really pleased that you could come and uh, we followed children into the community and we uh, made the following observations. We showed that children with HIV were more permissive for the growth of mycobacteria in their blood. If you took their blood out, you added the mycobacteria in the laboratory, uh, than children who didn't have HIV. So here are the healthy children, and here are the children with HIV. And you can see the growth ratio is higher, so they are less able to control, which goes with the fact that they are more susceptible to TB. It then also shows that if you give them antiretroviral therapy, within a very short frame, frame time, uh, you can actually improve that situation and uh, you can get them to a stage where they're controlling the mycobacteria quite well. And because people always criticize that we had done this with BCG and not with a real pathogen, we repeated this with a real pathogen, which is MTB, and we uh, had the same observations. We wanted to know about the CD4 T cells and their correlation within the restriction of growth because obviously then this assay would really tell us something about functionality. And both at baseline and at 12 months, there was uh, a very good correlation between the CD4 count. So the higher CD4 count, the lower your growth ratio would be, which means that it was primarily the CD4 T cells that mediated the, the um, uh, restriction in growth. We wanted to go a step further, and um, this is Gwen Tenner, who is uh, my PhD student from South Africa, who set up, again, with support by the Wellcome Trust, uh, uh, various methods of analyzing these T cells, in particular CD4 T cells, in more detail. So we wanted to look at what cytokines they make, and also what memory phenotype they belong to. Because as I said before, you don't just need to know what the cells do at the moment, but you also want to know what they're going to do in a few years' time when you need them again. So um, here's the facts data for those who are interested. Um, so what we did was we stimulated small volumes of whole blood in, in the lab um, with various antigens some just non-specific, some specific for TB. And then we looked at the cytokines that these cells were excreting. And uh, IL-2 is a cytokine that's particularly related to memory T cells, interferon gamma a cytokine that's more related to effector cells. And you can see that some of the, uh, the CD4 populations produce dual cytokines, and there's the so-called polyfunctional T cells, and they were all a hype at the time. CD8 T cells don't make as much cytokine. So what happens now to the antigen-specific T cells, so the ones that really are supposed to be fighting off the TB infection? So a little bit to our surprise, or maybe because of naivety, um, actually we saw that what we had anticipated, that the number of those cells would go up over the time, actually didn't happen. And we um, looked at uh, interferon gamma and IL-2, and it just didn't show. And instead, when we started to look at the memory profiles, we understood why this was the case. Because what happens when uh, you give antiretroviral therapy to children is primarily the naive population that actually expands. And the naive population is not the population that carries the memory. It's the population that can be formed to then be educated to fight the infection later on, but it hasn't yet been exposed to the antigen. And so we characterized all of these uh, memory populations and the, the most striking finding was obviously that the naive T cells uh, proliferated uh, during ART. So in summary, the conclusions from those studies were that we could achieve, as we knew, um, a significant uh, a sustained increase in CD4 counts by putting children antiretroviral therapy, that this was associated with better growth restriction in the whole blood assay, that there was a significant increase of the naive T cells and some increase in memory T cells, and uh, that there potentially was a good window of opportunity to use new TB vaccines, particularly in those uh, patients who would have reconstituted their naive T cell population, because that would have been the population you would have wanted to prime. Now, when you're thinking about vaccines, you always need to ask yourself, how are you going to predict that a vaccine you want to give will actually have an effect in the host and it's relatively easy for vaccines that induce antibody and you know people have had childhood vaccines some of you might remember having had them and what we used to what we normally look for is an antibody titer which is protective against a certain infection when you see it again the b cells will kick in and they will um, deal with the pathogen to measure cell mediated immunity is a lot more difficult because of the cytokines that are mediating this effect and because we don't really have 
very good functional assays that mediate uh, um, this effect that we can measure. But the growth restriction assays that we've designed, we think can play a role. And to put that to the test, we um, looked at the example of vaccine, which is in this case the BCG vaccine, which is at least an established TB vaccine, where um, we recruited uh, from a postnatal setting in a maternal immunity place, uh, in a maternal uh, uh, unit, every morning we went there and we saw how many babies had been born overnight and if we were able to take their blood. And we subjected um, the blood in the lab to the growth assay to show whether we could show immunogenicity of the BCG vaccine. And uh, we could because before the babies had had their vaccine, their growth ratio median was about 12 and after three months later, um, it had dropped significantly. So this model showed this proof of concept that we could study the impact of vaccines on the immune response using cell-mediated immunity. And these assays since have been taken forward in the concept of vaccine assessment because people have slightly gone off the polyfunctional T cells as being a correlate of prediction of protection. And um, the ARIS uh, Global TB Vaccine Foundation is currently conducting some studies to compare these assays and, and see which ones could move forward into the field. So whole blood models uh, have played a central role in, in uh, what we showed because they have certain advantages. They need very small volumes of blood. You also have all the components of the immune system present, except you're open to the criticism that not all the diseases you're studying actually happen in the blood. But uh, you don't make any assumptions about which cell type is going to play a leading role, and you can apply them to field settings and field situations. You can measure cytokines, and you can measure functional growth inhibition. By this point, it was time to expand the work in the lab, and obviously we were very much aware that CD4 T cells weren't the only answer to the problem of tuberculosis and control of tuberculosis because even people on antiretroviral therapy would still succumb to TB and there's a lot of people out in the world who are not HIV infected and they get TB as well and there's nothing majorly wrong with their CD4 T cells. So clearly some other mechanisms are also at play. And uh, Adrian Martineau who um, joined our lab as being a PhD student of Wilkinson persuaded me that it was worth looking at other mechanisms within this assay and he extensively investigated the role of neutrophils and has made a major contribution to uh, describing the role of neutrophils as being the early phagocytic cells involved in control of microbacteria and has subsequently gone on to do great things and conduct interesting studies with vitamin D. We became interested in the mother-infant interface as well because um, not just looking at TB but looking at the development of immunity, knowing that younger children are more susceptible, we wanted to know what is the role of the maternal side and if there's sort of set point at which uh, infants respond differently. And also we became interested in B cells, in particular in the context of HIV because although it's primarily a T cell and acquire T cell deficiency, we do know that uh, HIV positive people also don't respond as well to vaccines that are primarily inducing B cell responses. And Alistair Bamford, who's also here in the audience, has taken this subject forward in his PhD, and Chrissy Jones is working on the maternal interface. Liz Whitaker, who is currently in Cape Town, and uh, which really have liked to be here tonight, but uh, I'll tell you a bit about her project in a minute. She's looking at other cell types, which are also T cells, but uh, might play a more regulatory role because uh, we know that the age uh, of susceptibility to TB varies in, in the children. And Sarah Bell, who's my postdoc, is interested particularly in uh, toll-like receptor signaling and has done very interesting studies on uh, the progression of TLR responses from very early infancy to within the first year of life. And I was really looking forward to someone doing the NK cell studies and the only person who volunteered was Sebastian. So if anyone wants to work on NK cells, there's still space. Right, so um, Liz's work in Cape Town is looking at the age-dependent susceptibility to tuberculosis. It's also looking at disease severity because we don't really know if the reason why people get disseminated diseases because they're all very small and their immune system is still not really educated or whether there's something going on in the regulation of their interplay between certain cytokines which are more pro-inflammatory and others which are more uh, anti-inflammatory and the regulatory T cells probably play a role here. I'm not presenting any results of that tonight. So, but people who know me well know that I'm not the world's most patient person and I was kind of, you know, sitting there thinking, okay, what else can we do? 
And obviously, if you speak to clinicians in the field, what people want is improved diagnostics. What they also want is implementation of, inf of interventions that we already know work. And there are a number of interventions out there um, that if only we implemented them, we could save quite a number of people from TB. So in order to nurture this part of the work and get more involved in, in international collaborations on a more pragmatic way, really, um, I set up this uh, pediatric tuberculosis network for which uh, a talented friend of ours just designed our beautiful logo. We set this up in 2009 to really look at TB in Europe because TB in Europe is quite different from TB in Africa because it's much more patchy and the continuous exposure to tuberculosis is much less. So the studies we can do in terms of evaluating anti, uh, di new diagnostics are different. And people still were struggling, but they have much better ways of investigation as well. So we set up this network um, to really come to some collaborative uh, research and an evidence base of the diagnosis and treatment uh, of TB in children. And it's actually quite staggering if you go through all these various countries, uh, how many different policies there are for uh, giving drugs to children with TB. And we evaluated, um, every, literally a lot of people got interested in interferon gamma release assays, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about those tonight. But uh, we managed to pull together data from over a thousand children who had been investigated with these assays uh, throughout this European network and, and showed that there's probably evidence for a role of BCG in protection against infection, which is a highly debated subject because people always say BCG doesn't protect against infection. And I can see Ajit in the room who's also got data who uh, has shown similar things. So the other thing we've done is, um, in order to capture really what goes on, set up an international database for pediatric tuberculosis where people from the various sites can uh, upload results. It's all totally voluntary and, and uh, we hope, rather than going painfully through retrospective studies, that in the near future we'll be able to recruit to this network uh, prospectively and then can do um, other work as well. Um, in terms of diagnostics, we have also set up um, a prospective study within the UK here, and I'm pleased that Dennis and Olga are around because they're running this project for most of the time when I'm in the Gambia. Uh, and this project is looking at the use of these interferon gamma release assays in the, um, for latent infection and how we can tailor our policies for chemoprophylaxis uh, to children who are exposed to TB. So this brings me to the Gambia. And uh, we have uh, some, just rounding off on the TB theme, uh, we've got a project there set up, which uh, Rifat Atun came to see uh, in January, which is funded by the Stop TB Partnership, which actually is using an intervention that already we know works because we're implementing it in all of our countries in Europe, which is giving children who've been exposed to TB in the household chemoprophylactic treatment uh, to pre prevent them from progressing to active disease. And this is a WHO recommendation for all children in the world of the age under five, but in resource poor setting, it's not implemented. So this is not rocket science. This is sheer implementation research. And, you know, we can probably save quite a number of children from getting TB by just using tools we already know work in our settings in resource poor settings. And on the back of setting up this household study, we can also gather samples of children who are exposed, infected, and diseased for the more scientifically oriented uh, uh, studies of detailed immunology. So um, in 2010, I was approached by, by the MRC to have a look at whether I could possibly do work in vaccinology at the MRC unit, the Gambia. And it was just too good an opportunity to say no to because this country has a very small surface, it has a very limited population, but it still has a significant problem of childhood mortality. And if you look at this number, 19 times more children die in this country under the age of five than they die in the UK. So there's still a lot of work to be done. And uh, vaccinology is one of those areas where I could bring a certain expertise progressing uh, not just in tuberculosis research, but also in exploration of other vaccines. The MRC has a very distinguished record of uh, vaccine research, and I'm really very honored that Sir Brian Greenwood is amongst us here because he's driven a lot of these developments at the MRC in the Gambia when he was the director there. And everything that's marked with a star here shows that some MRC research has happened within this timeline on vaccines that were implemented in the Gambia and now form a very important part of uh, their vaccine schedule. 
But of course, vaccine efficacy is not necessarily equivalent to vaccine impact, and there are many, many, many other factors that we need to consider, such as acceptability, pricing, sheer challenges of delivery to vaccines in various countries, and again, RIFAC spent a lot more time worrying about those things than about the immunology. But what this platform offered to me was a fantastic opportunity, or is a fantastic opportunity, to combine basic research all the way through to implementation research and actually shaping vaccine policy through vaccine trials that have been done in countries like the Gambia or in West Africa in more general terms. And we have projects that are centering on healthy uh, infants uh, who are just you know, being assessed for their basic immune function in the absence of particular infections. We have vaccine trials for new TB and HIV vaccines, and we have the ability to also observe the impact of vaccines that have recently been implemented on the overall health of the children. And also importantly, for someone who's quite a lab-based person like myself, we can bring this experience back to the preclinical and to basic research to the bench. So just to give you a few examples of this work, and again, I'm very pleased that uh, quite a number of members from the MRC of Gambia are here tonight. Um, Jane Sutherland amongst them, who was instrumental in this study done in Martin Otter's lab um, on TB vaccines, which showed that although a newly developed TB vaccine is quite immunogenic, there are challenging uh, problems if you're thinking about introducing such a vaccine into the already existing EPI schedule, because we saw that uh, it's less immunogenic if given at the same time as the EPI vaccines, which are the routine childhood vaccines. So there are challenges, even though we might have a very good vaccine, we still need to see how it plugs in. Alistair doesn't work in the Gambia, but uh, his subject is very much based in the area of vaccinology, um, which is looking at the link and the crosstalk between T cells and B cells. And he has enabled us to uh, move forward uh, work in the lab where we now have extensive ability to characterize B cell populations uh, using the fax machine. And we can uh, distinguish uh, uh, B cell profiles in children with and without uh, HIV infection in particular, following uh, the hypothesis that HIV positive children have lower a particular type of T helper cells, which are called uh, T follicular helper T cells, then HIV negative children, and this might explain why their immune responses to certain vaccines are not as robust. And Alice's testing this hypothesis uh, in the context of the PCV13 vaccine in conjunction with David Goldblatt's work at the Institute of Child Health. Um, the main question is still, to my mind also, is there more we can do to prevent infection that very early period, uh, sort of in the first few months after birth? Because as you probably know, most vaccines are given to babies past two, three, and four months of life. And a lot of the mortality occurs very, very early. And is there something we can do to influence this? Is there something we can do to either vaccinate these babies earlier, or is there a chance to actually vaccinate the mothers who can then pass on the immunity to their infants. And uh, Dr. Christine Jones spent time in Cape Town on her PhD project to examine the influence of maternal antibody for the protection of infants uh, uh, once they've got their vaccine, working on the assumption that if you are um, either HIV positive or negative, uh, there might be an element of placental transfer that will determine the vaccine-specific antibody responses. So putting all this jigsaw together, Chris has shown very nicely that not only in HIV-infected um, women, but also in HIV non-infected women, uh, there's a certain number of, of women, if you think about a cutoff line around here for these various antibody assays, who will not be protected themselves against vaccine-presented preventable diseases, and who can therefore not pass on a level of protective antibody to their infants that will be useful to protect them. And this opens up a whole new area of potential maternal immunization strategies. And we have, in the meantime, also repeated um, these sorts of assays with uh, samples from the Gambia, and we've been fortunate to have funding from the Biomedical Research Center here at Imperial College, and uh, again, we have managed to recruit several hundred women uh, to follow these studies. So where are we going now? Obviously, there are very exciting new technologies uh, becoming available to vaccine development be they reverse uh, uh, immunology or be they genetic engineered vaccines. And there are people in the audience here who know quite a lot more about that uh, because they work with the pharmaceutical companies that are making these vaccines. 
To me, it opens up areas of uh, thought for maternal immunization strategies. Um, I still think we need to learn a lot more about the T and B cell interactions because that will also guide our, our vaccine development and we can further work on optimization to measure cell-mediated immunity. Our work on tuberculosis at the moment centers on uh, trying to still pursue the uh, mechanisms of protection, in this case from TB infection, and also we maintain a keen interest on the evaluation of novel diagnostics in both resourceful as well as resource settings. And uh, I'm going to round off uh, by thanking the Imperial team that's been working with me for the last few years, and uh, most of them you've heard a little bit about their work. We've got uh, Robin Basu and uh, Anna Battersby, who are the ACFs who are just putting forward their fellowships, so they'll be following in the footsteps of uh, the people up here who might be finishing their work very soon. And we didn't just have a productive time in terms of publications, it was an extremely productive time in terms of children's output. And <laughs> although that has its challenges, it's uh, actually very lovely. And uh, there are two buns in the oven as far as I know. None of them is mine. Right. So this is the team of uh, scientists that I'm now privileged to lead at MRC The Gambia with obviously the supervision and help of uh, Professor Kamani Tumanikora, who is the um, director of the MRC unit and who is a fantastic African leader and kid friend. And none of this would happen if we didn't manage to get money. And writing grants is part of the job description and we have been yeah, blessed with quite a bit of funding from various organizations and we have to continue applying to them because otherwise we can't move things forward. And none of it would also happen if people weren't prepared to sign up their children for research studies. And actually, this is found to be easier to do in Africa than it is found to be done in our, in our settings. However, with, I think, a bit of perseverance and, and good explanations, we have been successful in doing this kind of research, research in, the, in the UK as well. And um, I think, you know, I can only thank all these various children in all these various places to have given a few drops of their blood to, to guide and drive our science. So of course, the main people I have to thank are my parents because without their <laughs> unquestioning support over all this time, uh, I would never be here. And I have to thank these two characters who are my travel companions, Martin and Jim <laughs> and Sebastian. And, uh, you know, there's always this talk like you're never home and what happens and how can people possibly look after a family if they're always on the road. Actually, sometimes it's, it's very nice not being home because if you've been away long enough, they might make you a really nice sign on the wall <laughs> that by the time you come back, they're really quite pleased to see you. So I would highly recommend it, ladies. Just don't be put off, you know. And, <laughs> As you can see, uh, children can grow up to uh, be quite adventurous and independent travelers with all sorts of means of transport uh, in the meantime. And by the end of the day, no road is long with good company. And I've been blessed with extremely good company. And I'm blessed with all this great company here tonight. And I thank you for your attention.